Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Hello, hello. Yeah. We live on all of my platforms. I think I did it this time. Third time's a charm. <laughs> Wonderful. So, uh, great. How was your, uh, how was your, uh, uh, your Rose Parade? It was awesome. The funniest thing about the Rose Bowl Parade when you attend in person is there's not this constant commentator telling you, now this float's made with these things, these flowers and these bits and bobs. And, you know, it was kind of like, okay, this is really cool, but it's like really strange. Ah. And where we were sitting in the bleachers, when the you know the equestrian teams would go by and then they have the pooper scooper teams go by everybody cheered and screamed for the pooper scooper team it was so cool <laughs> i'm yeah. like that's cool so it was yeah. definitely worth the trip it did not rain because it had rained what was it new year's eve it rained like crazy people had gone to the they call it um band fest so where all the bands get to perform as they normally would, not just marching down the streets of Pasadena. And it was raining so hard. I'm like, I don't do rain. And I'm still trying to get over this stupid bronchitis, sinus infection, cold crap all that I had. So we stayed stayed back and everybody's like, oh God, hope it doesn't rain on the parade. I'm like, it does not rain on the Rose Bowl parade. And everybody's like, shh, you're gonna jinx it. I'm like, no, I'm not, trust me. So finally we're sitting there, you know, and I think there was like a 40% chance of rain on. Um, on the second, which is when the parade was this this year, and everybody's like, "I hope it doesn't rain." I hope it. Doesn't. I'm like, forty percent chance of rain in California is as good as zero. So I finally whip out my phone. I'm like, "Hey, uh, that that search engine thing we all talk to. I don't want to fire it up on any of these computers." <laughs> um, how many times has it rained on the Rose Bowl parade in the last hundred and thirty five years? Ten times. I'm like, I think our chances are good. So <laughs> yeah, there's a. Go yes, ahead. Really very good. Very, very good. Uh, yeah. But it, it can be cold. It can be a chilly morning. It was. And we had seats where our back was to the sun. So yeah, it was, it was a bit nippy. You know, we bought the little cushions that say Rose Bowl Parade on them just to keep from having to sit on the ice cold bleachers. <laughs> but it was definitely, it was a bucket list trip. And then on our way home, which was so dicey because it was raining and blowing and just poof. I was like, huh, I'm not sure I have another bucket list item. I better fix that. <laughs> <laughs> so I see you have Jenny with you right there. She seems to be paying attention to my my little story. <laughs> she is uh, she is riveted. Yeah, she's always very <laughs> listening. Why, why don't you tell us about you and how you came to create Jenny, who is the original version of Tom Bot's and I forgot what version you guys are working on it now, but you can tell us all about that. Absolutely. Happy to. Thank you for having me, Jennifer. Uh, so I'm Tom Stevens. I'm CEO and co-founder of TomBot. And this is Jenny. Jenny is a fully interactive robotic emotional support animal. And she'll be the first to be both an FDA medical device and a remote safety and health monitoring platform. Uh, my background is I've been in the high-tech industry for 35 years. My two, yeah, you'll get a chance to talk. <laughs> my, uh, my two Tom uh, co-founders and I built a prior startup into one of the world's largest litigation automation companies. We were successfully acquired in 2011, which gave me the freedom to think about other things. Unfortunately, uh, that same year, my mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and I had to take away her dog for safety reasons. Uh, I started looking around for substitutes for live animal companions. I didn't find anything that she liked or would respond to. So I wondered if technology might play a role. That launched me on a multi-year research and education journey, which culminated a master's degree from Stanford University. And along the way, I learned that my mom's story isn't unique. There are tens of millions of people around the world that have Alzheimer's dementia, uh, uh, and about a billion people in total that suffer from some form of serious mental health disorder. 
And so we launched Tombot in 2017 to help those people. So tell us about your mom's dog that you had to take away because for those who are listening now or in the future, Tom and I got to meet, as you might've kind of guessed, as I was traveling down to Southern California for the Rose Bowl parade. And I brought, of course, you know, my two, uh, my two co-conspirators in podcasting, uh, almost said Jinx, Jinx was, <laughs> Jinx is the prior dog, Luna and Remy. And Luna and Remy right now might get replaced with a Jenny because Luna is terrified of the waffle maker and does bad things because of it. And Remy has decided he doesn't like to eat kibble anymore. So he's, they're both making me crazy right now. <laughs> oh boy. Well, but I, um, my, my listeners know that they are golden retrievers. My mom had a poodle, which is kind of a tie-in with your mom's dog and what the issue was with, um, I don't know, I think I know the dog's name. Uh, golden bear golden that's a great one <laughs> yeah uh, uh, so i grew up with animals my mom was a huge animal lover we had uh we lived in a kind of a, a rural part of the suburb of los angeles a thousand oaks area of california and we had horses in the backyard we had chickens ducks geese other birds uh from time to time fish uh but of course traditional pets like cats and dogs. We, we always had animals and they were uh, just sort of ever present uh, in my life and, and ever present in my mom's uh, life. Uh, my parents split up when I was a teenager. And even though my dad remarried, my mom never did. And she came to pride herself on living independently. And one of her tools for success for independent living were, were her dogs and cats. And, and as time went by and, and the, the, the pets passed on, the, the numbers of them dwindled. Uh, but she always always had at least one dog. And, and her very last dog, Golden Bear, uh, was a two-year-old golden doodle, or is, well, was at the time, but still is a golden doodle. Uh, uh, a beautiful dog, ordinarily lovely disposition, that she managed to train to be aggressive towards her caregiver. Um, uh, we had some very tough decisions to make early on uh, after my mom's uh, diagnosis. The first really tough one was uh, coming to terms with the fact that my mom could no longer live safely and successfully on her own. Um, we moved in a professional caregiver and she hated it. Um, <laughs> Uh, second bad day was second bad day was coming to terms with uh, uh, with the fact that she shouldn't drive anymore. So taking away her car keys, and so not only had her independence been uh, taken away, she had to ask permission uh, to go anywhere and get assistance. So that was pretty unhappy. But neither of those days compared to the third day um, uh, in taking away her dog. Uh, uh, so. The dog uh, somehow picking up on my mother's displeasure with the caregiver started growling whenever the caregiver would enter the room. And my mom would laugh and pet the dog, reinforcing the behavior. And pretty soon the, the caregiver couldn't move anywhere in the house safely. Fortunately, uh, we had very close family friends that wanted to make a new home for the dog and the dog's still enjoying a lovely life uh, there. But my mother was devastated. Um, she was devastated and she was really angry. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, every day was, where's my dog? Why can't I have my dog? When, I get, when am I getting my dog back? And I went from being the, the golden son uh, uh, to being the bad guy and really just destroyed our relationship. So a good part of this motivation was just trying to make my mom happy again and happy with me. Uh, <laughs> I didn't realize that, that there was anybody else like my mom at the time. I thought this was my mom and, and you know, her own individual journey. And, and sadly it is, everyone who goes through this goes through their own individual journey, but, but they're not alone in terms of other people in similar circumstances so so that led you to creating jenny no wow. relation whatsoever hi jenny <laughs> so I, I, I even so, over zoom i'm just amazed at how realistic she is so you could tell us all about her it yeah. whatever her <laughs> so, so one of the things i learned uh after 
after my mom's uh, uh, you know, incidents and, and through my educational journey uh, uh, is that this is a very well-researched area. Uh, there are over 150 peer-reviewed studies that have been done to date that show that where a senior with dementia can form a robust emotional attachment to an object, traditionally that object's a human baby doll or a stuffed animal, that senior gets a great deal of relief from the behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia, you know, loneliness, frustration, and in the other's case, hallucinations or kind of anger. Uh, and they also get a great deal of relief, uh, corresponding reduction in need uh, for psychotropic medications. Psychotropics are anti-anxiety, antidepressants, and antipsychotics. Um, and not only do those medications turn seniors like my mom into zombies, they carry grave health risks. Uh, There's a study done a few years ago out of the Veterans Administration uh, uh, showing that as many as 25% of their seniors on the antipsychotics were actually killed by them. Oh, that's yeah. a horrible number. And so, I mean, it's, it's shocking, um, so much so that the FDA requires a black label on the box now uh, so that seniors are, are, are not getting this unless it's absolutely a, a last recourse. Um, the uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid now forbid their use in long-term care facilities on, a, um, on what's called an as-needed basis or PRN basis. So, so a lot has been learned over the years about, about seniors with dementia and about the medications. Um, but for seniors like my mom, uh, who don't care for the traditional objects like the human baby dolls or stuffed animals, they were left without solutions. So um, the first thing we did uh, when we launched the company is started studying what seniors with dementia wanted in a uh, uh, in an emotional attachment object. And it was quite a challenge um, in that most seniors with dementia cannot reliably give verbal information as to their preference. You can't ask them a question and get useful information. So we worked with Georgia Tech and the University of Illinois to develop a coding system uh, for observations. And so things like did they look at it? Did they smile at it? Did they touch it? Did they hold it? Did they move it? Did they talk to a friend about it? Uh, uh, and we quantified those interactions and used that to help understand where preferences lie. Did you prefer A versus B? Uh, and we ultimately did three rounds of customer studies with hundreds of seniors with dementia. And what the big takeaway there was that seniors prefer uh, First of all, objects that move. Uh, secondly, things that they're familiar with. So dogs and cats as opposed to uh, wildlife or myth mythological uh, creatures. Uh, and then thirdly, the more realistic, the better. Realism in terms of appearance, realism in texture, and most importantly, realism in behaviors. Being a bunch of tech folks, we had no idea how to do that. So we reached out to the animatronics community in Hollywood and teamed up with Jim Henson's Creature Shop, the people behind Muppets and Sesame Street and many uh, very realistic uh, uh, props for television uh, and film commercial. Uh, and with their help doing our artistic design, we're building what we believe to be is the world's most realistic robotic animals. They are scientifically designed to stimulate emotional attachment in seniors with dementia. And then once that attachment's in place, they become the ideal platform for monitoring that senior for safety and health purposes. And how does that work? How does it, how does it do the monitor? How does she do the monitoring? <laughs> Great question. So, so um, when, you think of, when you think of a robot like Jenny, uh, think about a real dog or even think about ourselves. Um, we have a brain, uh, and we also have a sensory system. We can, we can feel things, we can hear things, we can feel movement. Same thing with the robot. Robot can detect all of those things, and it's capturing that information while you're interacting with it, and it makes an inference about what's happening in its environment, and then shows a behavior that's appropriate for that context. Uh, well, those same sensors can be useful for monitoring a person. Uh, we all will be the first device uh, of any kind that will be useful for providing objective feedback to doctors 
for treating sundowning syndrome. Uh, sundowners is where late in the day, the senior uh, gets especially confused and disoriented. Uh, it's one of, the, uh, one of the prime times for wandering risk and other um, uh, uh, behaviors, uh, negative behaviors. Um, and despite it being very common, it's very poorly understood which renders treatment by doctors uh, to be provided on a, a trial and error basis. So with, with feedback from the robot, um, we'll be able to help the doctor know that uh, changes that they, they suggest in sleep timing, in meal timing and contents, and medication dosages and timing of administration, how they're having an impact on sundowner syndrome. And we're working with Cleveland Clinic, their Center for Geriatric Innovation, uh, to design the user interface so that doctors at a glance can get that information and, and understand whether they need to continue making changes or whether the changes they've made have, have stabilized the patient for the time being. That'll be fascinating. And I believe yeah, this is- Pardon me, go ahead. Well, the Cleveland Clinic didn't, um, I believe the women's Alzheimer's Movement Maria Shriver's foundation has teamed up with them. Also, they have like a, all Clinic, the all the entities are coming together. <laughs> exactly. So Cleveland Clinic is one of the foremost uh, hospital systems in the world, uh, uh, and you know, part of being an academic research hospital uh, health system, they're very active in not only doing research but also um, uh, implementing innovative ideas. And one of the things with Maria Schreiber's organization, the WAM group, uh, is to be trying new things. Uh, I believe they're working with the Las Vegas locations uh, of the Cleveland Clinic. Um, uh, but very exciting to see that, uh, that relationship and it, it certainly feeds into uh, the work that we're doing and, and ultimately see maybe some of the WAM uh, uh, people, WAM patients actually using, using our puppies. <laughs> So there was something very special you learned about creating realistic eyes, especially for older adults with a cognitive disease. Uh, so, so the eyes are very important. I mean, you can, I don't know how well it shows up on the video here, but, but Jenny has really wonderful looking eyes. The Henson, uh, the Henson folks uh, were it was an area of particular attention uh, that they they paid so that the dog, you know, didn't look like a dead animal. It looked like something that had some some life uh, inside it. And what we learned uh, in our studies is that one of the most important features, and I'm going to show you, this is uh, this is Alpha One Jenny. This is actually a more advanced version than, than this Jenny, but she this one doesn't have any of the fur or other cosmetics on it. We're, we're just doing testing, but this is a wholly redesigned uh, version, which is a big step towards production. And on this one, you can see that, of course, we have the eyes, but we also have something up here in the center, which controls the eyebrows. Uh, there was a study done out of the United Kingdom that wanted to understand why certain dogs were adopted before others out of shelters. And they looked at variables such as size, color, breed, disposition. None of that seemed to matter very much. What mattered was the dog's ability to raise its inner eyebrows. And what's, what's really fascinating about this um, is human beings have been selectively breeding dogs for thousands of years to imitate the traits in human babies that cause us to want to care for human babies. And one of the areas of, of keen is, is really an eyebrow expression. Um, we call them, I mean, we humans generally call these puppy dog eyes, where, where the dog can raise its inner eyebrows and go, the, please take care of me. Look, I mean, if you look at your dog, if you have a dog uh, at home there, you'll see that your dog has the ability to raise its inner eyebrows. Well, it turns out that's unique to domesticated dogs. Wild wolves do not have that capability. So this was something mm. that was selectively bred in, creates unique musculature around the eyes that gives them the ability to pull their eyebrows up and in. And what the study out of the UK showed is that was the single most important trait 
for adoption and for us, uh, our thesis is the single most important trait for actually stimulating emotional attachment. And Tombot will be the first and only robots uh, that have the ability to raise their inner eyebrows and give you those puppy dog eyes. So very exciting, very exciting for us, uh, but also just kind of fun uh, learning about dogs and how dogs manipulate us in the <laughs> Yeah, I must get the puppy dog eyes 100 times a day, collectively between the two. If I put on my tennis shoes, um, most of my listeners know I have a Peloton. So when I go to the gym, it's just a few steps out into the right now very cold garage. <laughs> and if I put on my tennis shoes to be doing some strength training or whatever, they get so excited because they think they're going to go for a WALK. They're not in the room right now, so I probably could say the word, but I know better. Um, they're really good at paying attention when you're cooking. Yesterday I was baking cookies and Mr. I don't feel like eating my kibble anymore, but I'll eat anything else. He was like counter surfing and looking at me like, mom, I'm hungry because I refuse to eat my breakfast. It's like, <laughs> dog, you're killing me. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing. Like, you're like, no, I'm not going to fall for it. And then you fall for it. <laughs> it's just, it just killed it. I've had dogs my entire life. So 56 years and, you know, it just, it just amazes me. But wasn't there something you learned about the actual eye, the shape, the size, the style? Not just the well, eyebrows? So it, with, it, within the eye itself, uh, uh, really important that it has some depth to it. Once again, it can't look like a dead animal eye. It has to, it has to have some, uh, some depth to itself. And, and once again, really hard to tell on, on Zoom uh, <laughs> right up close. But what you'll see is that the eyebrow, the eyeballs rather, have, have a lot of depth to them. Uh, and so it, you know, it is a glass eye, you know, just like you might have with an artificial eye, uh, but it has all of the, all the intricate details that dogs have in their eyes. And, and the, the dog's eye is mostly pupil. Uh, uh, a dog, unlike humans, that have much, uh, as a percentage of our iris, have a much smaller percentage that makes up the pupil, unless it's a really dark room. Dogs have a larger percentage of the iris, and it's important with the iris, the black part of the iris, that it doesn't just look like a flat black, but it looks like it has, uh, or pardon me, the pupil, uh, not just a flat back black. Um, anyway, uh, uh, with, I, it, was there something else that you were thinking about that, uh, that we had well, talked about? I think, didn't you experiment around with like bigger ones that were more cartoonish or? Oh, oh, oh yes, thank you. So. In the second round of customer studies, uh, one of the things that, so we learned that we, we needed things that moved um, well, from the first round, but we also knew that, that seniors didn't want things that looked like toys. And so we wanted to test that further. Uh, uh, you know, it's interesting. Um, yeah. A lot of seniors don't relate to toys like kids relate to toys. Like I, I, I like to say my mother never went walking down the toy aisle at Target, shopping for herself. Um, the toy industry and caps at about 13 years of age. And so if you're over 13, you probably don't relate to toys the same way that somebody under the age of 13 would. Um, and so, and so we, we learned on our first round of customer studies that the object needed to move. It couldn't be like a stuffed animal, it needed to have movement to it, but it couldn't appear like a toy. And so with our second round of customer studies, um, we wanted to experiment with non-toy-like appearances. And so we created one that looked cartoon-like, which is a little bit different. Um, and so when you think of cartoons, think Disney. So oversized eyes, oversized nose, oversized ears, um, heads a little bit larger as a proportion to the body. Um, and we compared that to a much more realistic um, looking version, not as realistic as Jenny, but more realistic than the toy or the cartoon version. And 96% uh, of the people uh, preferred the realistic version to the cartoon version. So it wasn't, it, in that particular um, study, it wasn't anything specific to the eyes, only that their proportions needed to be accurate. Um, uh, human beings are really, really good at facial identification. 
we're extraordinary at it. Uh, and we're very sensitive to proportions um, in, uh, in, in humans, but also a sense of proportion, uh, proportion in animals as well. Well, puppies, like babies, their head is larger than the adult version as a proportion to the rest of their body. But Disney, uh, when they started drawing cartoons in, in the early part of the 20th century, started experimenting with, with more exaggerated features and found that there was a lot of audience feedback, positive audience feedback, saying, okay, this is really endearing. We really want Bambi to have the big doe eyes, and we want the... Uh, 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 there, there's a great movie, I'm, a, I'm forgetting what the title of it was, but it was one of the first kind of realistic um, uh, nature movies that, that Disney animated. It's about a, a scene in, in a, an abandoned barn uh, it's a, a, during a storm and the animals are sheltering there before the storm. And, and uh, if you look at that, that's probably as close as they've ever gotten to realism. And they still kept things a little bit exaggerated, but everything after that was even more exaggerated just to make them endearing. Seniors didn't care for that. Uh, seniors wanted it to look just like a dog and not like Disney's idea of a dog. So we've been able to hear her a little bit in the background. There's something specific about her her voice or whatever, her bark or whatever we're calling it. Well, Jenny, uh, so part of the realism was making sure that everything about the robot was as, as, as authentic as possible. And Jenny is bottled after an eight to 10 week old Labrador retriever puppy. And everything you hear are authentic uh, sounds from eight to 10 week old Labrador retriever puppies. Uh, they're, uh, let me see if I can get her to do something more here. Jenny, want a treat? Oh, of course, under pressure here, you're not going to do it. <laughs> Jenny, speak. Not going to do it. <laughs> of course, yeah. So Just this like is all why, dogs. This is why she's not our most current version. Now, there, there are a lot, the electronics in the newer versions are, are much better. She's just the most recent one with the animations. But the point is that everything in the robot are authentic puppy sounds. And so the whining, the howling, the barking, the cooing sounds, the snoring when she mm -hmm. sleeps, all of those are authentic puppy sounds. And, uh, uh, and we have quite a few of them in the production version. We'll have dozens uh, of unique sounds that the, that the robot makes, um, not only in response to commands, which she's like a regular dog, ignoring <laughs> most of my commands, uh, <laughs> but just even on her own when she wants attention or uh, when she's simply reacting to something, uh, uh, she'll make a very authentic sound. Even even in the background, it's like, I mean, having had dogs forever, I, I and I knew that, but it just, it still warms my heart. It just kills me <laughs> over Zoom and it's a robotic dog and it's just crazy. So what else should people know? These aren't out for consumer purchase just yet. You showcased the Clifford, which is the red one that doesn't have any fur on it yet. And even in action, just for people who who got only got a glimpse of him, even in action, Clifford is still kind of endearing, even though he's kind of a little slightly creepy with the red plastic body. <laughs> but the rest yeah. of it is so endearing that it kind of negates the red plastic body for now. Yeah, you can you can see videos online of Clifford, and once again, Clifford is is an interim prototype, just meant for testing purposes, not meant for user purposes. Uh, this they'll look they'll look the same. One of the things you may notice is Clifford is smaller than Jenny. So uh, our new version, which actually is branded as Jenny too, Clifford, just a nickname of our of this prototype. Uh, but the production version that we ship to customers will will be Clifford size, which is slightly smaller than Jenny. Uh, and of course, all the fur and cosmetics and, and things like that. Um, but you can see videos uh, uh, on the website uh, of Clifford in action. And, and, and uh, as you're saying, Jennifer, even without any of the cosmetics, even being kind of this creepy plastic thing, it still moves and, and uh, has a sense of life to it. Uh, and so it, we're really very, very excited. Um, the, the reason why this isn't, the final version is even though Jenny looks great, um, she's not robust enough to survive everyday use. She's actually quite fragile. 
Uh, she's not capable of passing any of the many safety certifications that we need to attain before we start shipping, including from the FDA. And uh, she's not capable of being manufactured affordably uh, in large columns. She's, she's more of an artisan version. Everything's done by hand on her, where Clifford allows us to use more, uh, more uh, proper manufacturing techniques to, to, to put the robot together. Uh, and so with those things, uh, we've advanced the technology substantially. Uh, the, next, the next major milestone will be some revisions to, to Clifford's mechanical and electrical engineering, but also all of the final uh, cosmetics will be on that version too. So as soon as we have that completed, we'll be posting those on our, on our website and social media platforms. Which is awesome. You guys definitely should go it's just tombot.com, right? Just tombot.com. And if you cannot tell, Jenny is actually flat on the bottom so that it's easy, she easily sits on a person's lap. And you, she's just so dang cute. It kills me. <laughs> yeah. So you'll see that you'll see that in the photos and, and videos of Jenny, she's frequently on a bed. Um, uh, she's fully portable, just like Clifford, fully portable. She can be carried around. My mom carried her prototype around, which she nicknamed Bob. Uh, she carried around Bob uh, around like a football. Uh, <laughs> so very portable, uh, lightweight, weighs about five and a half pounds. Um, but uh, uh, flat on the bottom, because most seniors with dementia spend the bulk of their day sitting. Uh, they're sitting at a table, they're sitting on a sofa or a recliner. Um, and so the lap, the dog is designed as a lap dog. And by having a flat bottom, we distribute that weight over a much larger area. Uh, if you've, if any of your listeners have had, uh, had small animals or have small animals, even if they're five pounds or 10 pounds, they put all their weight on their four paws on your leg. It feels like an animal, uh, really uncomfortable. So by having a flat bottom, uh, it's, it's the, the least uh, realistic aspect of the dog. Um, it spreads that weight over a very large area. And so the, the user can have the robot sitting comfortably on their lap for hours without feeling like it's a burden. But uh, we also will uh, supply a bed like this as an optional accessory. And if Jenny is simply placed on it, she'll wirelessly recharge. And so we do expect most of our customers will will get the bed when that's available. Uh, even though Jenny can be plugged in rechargeable, it's just sort of nice to have her <laughs> in the bed. And a lot of people just like having her on a table or a nightstand or something like that where she can be touched uh, frequently and, but, but not necessarily on their lap. That is so cool. So you are hoping that these will be available 2025, is, am I remembering correctly? Well, we'll enter production in 2024. We're hoping to save a little bit of time and make the holidays next year. Uh, but worst case, uh, uh, we're looking at the very beginning of 2025. Um, we, are, uh, we are raising funds uh, to help us get the rest of the way across the finish line to first customer shipment. We've, we've raised and spent about $5 million to date. We're raising another five to finish the engineering, to make a few key hires, to get our production up and running, to get all those safety certifications, and then uh, money to buy parts and components <laughs> and, and start making these, these girls. That's so awesome. So we hopefully can look forward to Christmas 2024 with all everybody being able to buy a Jenny. That's Not our goal. Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> not just that Jenny yeah no we're uh yeah it's very excited actually kind of fun uh not to give uh props to a competing media outlet but we're actually in the Wall Street Journal today uh and uh we've we've driven, gotten a lot of attention from that article we're a feature in the family and tech uh section on on use of technology such as robotic animals and AI uh for helping seniors combat loneliness uh, and so that's uh, getting a lot more people that would like to have a puppy uh, uh, from that media coverage as well. That's terrific. Yeah, well, very, I, very I've cool. I've talked to various tech people with various tech devices, and like it or not, that is going to have to be 
one of the components of caregiving because we have a huge caregiver shortage. We had a shortage before the pandemic, but that was bad. Now it's just exponentially bad. We've got more younger people trying to maintain a career while taking care of a loved one full time. That's not sustainable. We got to come up with some answers, and Jenny is a good answer for a lot of a lot of the aspects of caregiving that you know we still have needs for. So I'm I'm very excited. I was very excited to to talk to you again today. I was really thrilled that we got to go see the workshop and meet Jenny in person. My dogs were very curious, but the hubby wouldn't let them get too close for fear that they might do something naughty. I don't think they would have, but you know, we don't want them chewing up Jenny. <laughs> that would be bad. We, we loved having you. It was a wonderful visit. Um, yeah, it's, you're, you're so right about, uh, about the caregiving being a challenge. Um, our, our aging population will continue to grow as the, the baby boomers are, are nicknamed the silver tsunami. <laughs> but every generation after them is larger. So this is this is a continue as we have population growth, an increasing percentage and increasing number of people um, will be uh, 65 and up. Uh, uh, and who's going to take care of them? If, if, uh, in Japan right now, if they have a terrible crisis, um, that they have declining birth rates, uh, and so their population has actually fallen. Uh, they do not have. Uh, uh, they, don't, they don't really allow much immigration there, so it's very difficult to bring in even foreign uh, guest workers into the country. So uh, countries like Japan and other developed nations who have declining birth rates, have longer living uh, populations, will all be faced with these same challenges. Um, you know, we are, we're not a complete solution for everything, uh, but what we are is a tool, uh, a tool for users, a tool for the family members, a tool for the professional caregivers uh, and medical providers uh, to try to improve quality of life, but also reduce the cost of long-term care. Yep, that's all terrific. I have re recently listened to a podcast. I've actually listened to two podcasts and read an article on between climate change and caregiving needs, mostly climate change, we need like a mass re-migration. Like we need to shift the, the population centers because there's places that are not going to be habitable. Probably Japan might be on that list with rising sea levels. But we also need people to you know, take care of our elders and still do things like what you and I are doing. And not everybody's cut out to be a caregiver. And it's not right that society expects us to. I just have one correction. The only generation not bigger than baby boomers or millennials, Gen X. <laughs> We're smaller. Is that right? I didn't yeah. realize that. Gen Xers are larger than baby boomers. Uh, no, so we're smaller. Baby, uh, baby, baby boomers mom. and millennials are bigger than, I mean, we get forgotten because we're, we're just the little smaller has-been generation. Oh, well, good to know. Thanks for the correction. Yeah, yeah it's, it's not a it's not a political statement to talk about the need for immigration. Uh, uh, you know, once again, without getting into any political sentiments, there, you know, a, a significant part of our economic growth uh, and a significant part of our filling of jobs comes from you know new people into our country, and so it's we need we need a way for people to come into our country and make positive contributions uh, to our country, and so. And, and I think you're right. I think climate change, uh, uh, I mean, job mobility, labor mobility has been a fact of life here in the United States for a hundred years. Um, it's a fact of life around the world now. People will move to other parts of the world to find uh, gainful employment, even if it wasn't climate change uh, induced. Uh, and that, but climate change is, I think, big fear there is it's just going to make it much larger waves of people happening in it within a relatively short span of time. So, so it, it, there are solutions to, to getting caregivers. So there are solutions to getting more workers. Uh, we just need to, we need to have the, uh, the ability to get that done. I totally agree. And you and I got to experience a month of rain. So, you know, after five years of like very little rain, and I think that's going to be a pattern that continues because we had five years ago, we had just this atmospheric river that filled up all the canals and dang near overflowed onto the roadways. And this past month was worse. 
<laughs> so I was beginning to think I was never going to see the sun again. And my solar battery was very depleted. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I'm afraid you guys are going to be looking at more rain here uh, coming up in the near future. Uh, I mean, we desperately need it. Um, as Southern California, thank you for collecting the water for us uh, <laughs> and donating it for our future use. But, uh, but, uh, but yeah, uh, the climate change, you know, from what I've read, uh, more extremes, uh, more drought, more intense uh, rain, and, and, and so we'll have to make adjustments there as well. Yeah, well, we had some rain yesterday. I don't know. I haven't looked at the. Yes, Jenny doesn't like rain either. <laughs> She's looking at the rain now. We're having a little bit of rain here in Southern California today. Oh, okay, it's it's. I live right above the fog level, so I live an hour north of Sacramento and an hour south of Lake Tahoe. So I'm in the I'm in a really great zone because I'm between the snowfall and the fog. So it's very bright and sunny, but dang, is it cold today. <laughs> The uh, we have a wine barrel that's turned into a fountain on our deck, and the top part, which is maybe eight or ten inches deep, my husband's like, "Oh my God, the water's frozen." <laughs> and I was like, "Oh great, I'm gonna go down and turn on the the secondary heater in my office because my office is technically it's not below ground, but it's downstairs." And while we were gone, and all the heat was turned off in the house. I think we discovered that the house is not as insulated as it should be built in 1988. So my office is freezing. And just a fun fact in the summer when it's, you know, 95 degrees outside and the air conditioner is running upstairs, I have the window wide open and then it's very comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I don't like it cold, but this has been fantastic. I will make sure that there's a link to the website so people can check out more and hopefully I can get this the live saved and re-uploaded by the end of today, which is almost the very end of January. I cannot believe we only have one more day of this month. Well, it's Jennifer, thank you so much for having us. I uh, really, really do appreciate it. It's uh, a pleasure meeting you and your husband and your two pups uh, a few weeks ago and and uh, hope, to, hope to have more news for you here in the coming weeks and months about us getting closer to making first customer shipments and and uh, perhaps visiting with you again. That would be awesome. You're not that far away, so it's possible. <laughs> oh yeah, you're happy. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Jenny. Well, good luck to both of you. And thank you so much for doing this live with me today. And I hope people are as fascinated and entranced, entranced with Jenny as I am. Thank you again. Thanks you're welcome. Having. Bye, everybody. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.